Well, I'm going to ask, if you would, stand with me. We are going to start by reading John 1, verses 14 to 18, and uh, I'm going to ask that you read it with me aloud in unison. Beginning in verse 14, let's read, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. The Word of the Lord. You may be seated. You know, as biblical passages go, there are few in the Scriptures and the entirety of the Bible with the scope and the grandeur of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, which is considered to be the prologue of the book of John. A couple of weeks ago, we began by looking at verses 1 to 5, where we were introduced to the truth that the Word, the second person of the Trinity, is the the creator of the universe, has brought light, true light, genuine light, into the world for all of humanity. And then last week, we saw that the majority of humanity will reject that light, but for those who do receive and believe in Jesus' name, they receive this light and they are authorized to now be called the children of God. Well, this week, we see the Word who is existed as God from eternity past until all of eternity. We see in this passage of Scripture where He leaves the glories of heaven and He enters as a human being into our time, into our space perfectly divine and perfectly human, all at the same time in one person. This is known as the incarnation. Say that word with me, incarnation. It is one of those extremely important Christian words. It reflects an extremely important important Christian doctrine and truth. And this morning, I want us to see several gospel applications out of verses 14 to 18 that involve the incarnation. First of all, the very beginning of verse 14, because of his incarnation, Jesus identifies with the totality of our existence. This passage opens up with a few simple words that are pregnant with meaning. And the word became flesh. Bruce Milne wrote an excellent book on the book of John. And he writes this, he says, this statement, is one of the most significant and memorable ever penned. Its implications are limitless. It has provided the church over the centuries with a key to understanding the mystery of Jesus Christ. It represents the heart and the climax of the gospel. Dr. Milne is right. The incarnation is incredibly important. The truth contained in this idea is significant in such a way that uh, it's really the springboard for our takeaway truth this morning. What I, what I want you to understand about the incarnation is that without it, there is no salvation. There's no salvation without the incarnation, and there's no slide because the clicker ain't working. There it is, okay. There is no salvation without the incarnation. Our redemption, it was pur- purchased, it was accomplished at the cross and with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the all-important precondition of the cross was the incarnation. Dr. Milne in his book, he, he rightly points out that this little word, this truth, has, is so grand that going all the way back into the original centuries of the church, there were those scholars, those uh, early church fathers and others who wrote about it. One of them who wrote quite extensively, uh, lived from 1033, 1034 to uh, 
1110, something like that. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was a guy by the name of Anselm. Anselm is given the title the Father of Scholasticism, which might sound kind of you know, scary to those of you who are still in school, but it was actually a very important movement because the Dark Ages were not dark because they didn't have electricity. The Dark Ages were dark because the Roman Catholic Church had clamped down on the, uh, the faithful and they had taken doctrine and they had turned it around and they really had an ethos within the church that you were not to question anything. They simply said things in a language that you did not understand and you were supposed to believe it. The vast majority of the Western civilization was illiterate. They couldn't read for themselves. They were totally dependent upon what the priests and the cardinals and the pope and everything said to them verbally as that this was the truth. But beginning with Anselm and some others, they began to come to the Christian faith from a different perspective, one that actually asked important questions. They, they kind of co-opted the Socratic method, and they looked to the, the logical uh, reasoning and the methodologies that, that were employed by Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and they took what Augustine did and how he approached the Scriptures using this way of thinking, and from that, they, they actually began to approach the Scriptures in a different manner. The, the fruit of all this is our school system, our educational systems, the university systems. All of this grew out of this movement. What we know as Christian apologetics uh, grew out of this movement. Anselm is the father of this movement, scholasticism. And one of the topics that he wrote most extensively about was the incarnation. In fact, one of his books was called Why God Became Man. And in that book, he's having this conversation between, this thing is not working, so you guys need to stay with me and, and help me here, okay? Um, he was having a conversation with a student asking and answering questions about the incarnation. And this is what he says at one point in the book, since no one saved God, no one except God can make satisfaction for our sins, and no one except man ought to make satisfaction for our sins, it is necessary for a God-man to make that satisfaction for our sins. And Anselm is right. And this is who Jesus is, the divine word who created the universe. He became flesh. Now, this, this does not mean that the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the word, simply came down and found a human being by the name of Jesus and kind of took up residence like a fleshly Airbnb. That's not what happened here. It's not like he didn't, he took up a temporary residence and then like right before the cross, he left. And the, the man Jesus died, but not the word, he didn't die. This, these are ancient heresies that keep cropping up throughout the centuries when we think about the humanity of Christ and what it means and the significance of it. And so John addresses this. He chooses an intentional word. It's the Greek word sarke, which we translate as flesh. And, and that idea of flesh is not just flesh and bones. That word sarke is referring, referring to the totality of the human experience and existence, the totality of a human being. Jesus came into the world in a manner that qualifies him to identify with us to the full degree of the human experience. He shared and he, in our weakness. He understands our vulnerability because he experienced it for himself. He shared in what it means to be tempted, to be frail, to have struggles. He understands where we come from. Why was this God's plan? Why was this the redempt, part of the redemptive plan of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Well, Paul in Romans chapter 8 answers the question for us. He says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son and a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us. Church, there is no salvation without 
the incarnation. But because of the incarnation, we have a Savior who can fully identify with the totality of our existence. We prayed a few moments ago for those in our church right now who are walking through the valley of the shadow of death with perhaps a family member. Some of you may be walking through that valley yourself because of a diagnosis or you're going through a very difficult time and trial in your life right now. The incarnation means that Jesus identifies with your pain and with your suffering, and he is qualified to provide you with the comfort that you need during this trial and during this time. And he stands eager and ready to give you that comfort. This means that for those of you right now who are perhaps struggling financially or you're experience various hardships in life because of the times that we live in right now, that you have a Savior, Jesus, who by human standards was very poor, homeless, often depending upon others and their financial gifts in order to have food and shelter and to be taken care of. You have a Savior who fully identifies with your experience and understands what you're going through because of the incarnation. Secondly, a second application is that through Jesus' incarnation, we better understand why we should glorify God. The second portion of this verse, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Literally, Verse 14 opens in a way that's significant. And when we look at it, we really have to look at this not through our Western civilization eyes. When we read this verse, we need to read it from the perspective of first century Israelites. Uh, John is writing to Jewish people who live in Palestine or who are scattered throughout the Roman Empire, and they have a national heritage they have a national experience that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And that heritage is reflected in the language that John uses here. Literally what he says in verse 14, the word became fully human and tabernacled among us. Tabernacled among us. That's, that's not a word that we would normally choose. What do you mean you tabernacled among us? You just took a noun and you made it a verb. Okay, we, what is, why? Well, it's because of what that word signifies to the Jewish people. I don't know if you remember or not, but back in October when we began our series in Joshua, the very first message we started talking, or second message, we were kind of giving you background about, about Joshua. You remember that, that moment in Joshua's life where he, he goes with Moses up Mount Sinai and where Moses ultimately receives the Ten Commandments. And in that moment, you know, God takes Moses and he puts him in the cleft of a rock and he hides him because Moses had asked him, would you, would you tell me your name and would you reveal your glory to him? And, Moses, and God says, Moses, I can't reveal my full glory to you. It would kill you. But I will let you see just the, the very back portion of the train of my glory. You think of, you know, that, that, uh, a king wearing robes, and he says, just the very back part of my glory, I'll let you see. And he, he does. And Moses sees just that little bit of God's glory. And when he comes back down the mountain part of the way, and he hooks, you know, he meets back up with uh, Joshua, and then they go down into the camp. Moses' face is so bright and brilliant from that little exposure to the unfiltered glory of God that he has to wear a veil for several weeks and because it was just too hard to look at as a human being. You remember in those stories that, that Moses and Joshua would go into this little tent and the glory of God would descend and, and they would end up communicating and interacting with God. A couple of years later, Moses gives instructions for the building of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is associated with the Jewish people throughout their wilderness wanderings. And for the first century or so in the promised land or, or more, before Solomon comes along and builds a, a much grander, beautiful, permanent temple, because he didn't lose his concrete uh, sub no, anyway, uh, he built all this stuff, right? And, and, and until that point in time, 
The glory, the Shekinah glory of God. How many of you have heard that expression? The Shekinah glory of God. Yeah, it, it left that one little, and it came over to this tabernacle, that what became known as the tent of meeting. And there, the Israelites were able to know God is with us, the glory of God is there, and they would go to that tabernacle as part of their worship. It, 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 it became a vital aspect of what it meant to be an Israelite to be the people of Jehovah. And so the tabernacle for goodness, uh, I guess it would end up being 500 years almost, becomes a central uh, place in the, in the life of the Israelite nation. And, and so what we have here is John saying, Jesus is the tabernacle. Essentially, he's the tabernacle of the new covenant. And, and when you think about it, I thought about that this week, and I love to look at the Old Testament. You know, the, the, the Old Testament points us to Jesus. And there's so many things that prefigure in the Old Testament or foreshadow in the Old Testament what is going to become reality in the New Covenant. And, and this, this aspect of that wilderness tabernacle. And when you dwell and you think about it and you consider for a moment how that Old Covenant tabernacle points us to Jesus, the tabernacle of the New Covenant, it it just reveals more and more of his glory. For example, in that wilderness tabernacle, outwardly, it was a very simple, plain, unattractive building or you know, structure. I mean, it was a glorified tent, a big tent, and it, and it wasn't an attractive tent. And how fitting is it then that the scriptures tell us that the Messiah, Christ, the, the covenant of the, or the tabernacle of the new covenant, his Shekinah glory, is going to be hidden in flesh as he comes humbly as a servant, not in majesty as a king. And that Shekinah glory is hidden in a fleshly body that apparently, well, let's just say he was no Brad Pitt of his generation. Outwardly, there was nothing to commend it to us. In fact, the unattractiveness of it was such that the, the Jewish people mocked and scorned and made fun of him. That wilderness tabernacle was a temporary abode that moved around from place to place to place. And you think about Jesus, who existed for 33 years, just as that, that tabernacle in the wilderness was 35, 36 years. And just as that tabernacle moved from place to place, Jesus says about his own life and his own ministry, that foxes have holes and birds have nests to call home, but the Son of God has no place to lay his head. That, outward, that Old Testament tabernacle, it was associated with the hardship and the deprivation of those wilderness years. Jesus and his humble birth that we celebrate next weekend was just the beginning of a life that was characterized by a wilderness type of experience. And most importantly, when you think about that Old Testament, Old Covenant tabernacle, it was God's dwelling place where his glory could be known and seen. And when you turn it forward and you look at Jesus a few chapters from here, for just a brief moment in time, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is going to permit his innate, inherent Shekinah glory to break through the veil of flesh, and Peter, James, and John are going to see it, and they're going to fall down and worship as they get just a glimpse of the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then, that Old Ta Testament tabernacle, that was where the people went to, to meet with God, to receive forgiveness of their sins, to commune with Him, and worship him. And as Jesus says over and over and over again, in the book of John, if you see me, you see the Father. If you worship me, you are worshiping God. If you meet with me, you're meeting with God. My words are your life, and they are your light that bring eternal life. There's a key point here that we, we shouldn't miss. The Shekinah glory of God was embodied and made visible to us in Jesus through the incarnation. Now, now, there was no glow about him except 
for that brief moment on the Mount of Transfiguration. There was no, the glory of God was not revealed to, to us in, in his life like it was to Moses on the mountain where just you get a little, and then you know, you're a, a neon sign. No, it was revealed differently. And, and John is suggesting in a better way in this new covenant. So for example, he revealed his glory through his actions and his miracles and his signs. In the next chapter, John chapter two, John the apostle begins to give example after example after example of this. He starts with the miracle at the wedding in Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine. And then this statement is made, this miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his, what's the word? Glory and his disciples believed in him. The ultimate expression of his glory being revealed to us happens at Calvary and on Easter Sunday. Jesus predicts this, he, he ties these things together. In John chapter 12, he replies, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his what? Oh, come on, wake up, his what? There you go. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But the, its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. What does Jesus say? How is his Shekinah glory most on display? His death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and the fruit that has come out of his message, the gospel, through the centuries. In other words, you and I, followers of Jesus Christ, are a manifestation of his Shekinah glory. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? And a vital aspect of our sanctification, now that we follow Jesus and believe in Jesus, is that Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit. And we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that the Holy Spirit is all about transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ from one level of glory to a higher level of glory, to a higher level of glory, to a higher level, until finally, ultimately, one day, when we see him at his return, we will be instantaneously transformed into the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our destiny. That's what's happening in our lives right now. What a beautiful truth. That through the incarnation of Jesus, we perceive God's glory and we receive God's glory because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And as he transforms us, this glory begins to shine out and we become light into the darkness, drawing and, and, and telling people about Christ and their need for salvation. When you dwell on this, when you think about this, when you consider this church, and you think about this glory of Christ that is now in part ours, it actually helps us to better understand why we should honor God with our lives, the totality of who we are. It helps motivate us to, for why we should glorify God together here on a Sunday morning in worship, giving God his glory. Well, one final application of this passage this morning this idea of incarnation. When we receive and follow Jesus, the passage teaches us that the fullness of God's grace and truth is now ours to appropriate. Verse 16 says, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. When the, uh, with the incarnation, God is reaching out to us. He is reaching out to us in our sin out of his faithful covenantal love for us. This is grace. Grace is God reaching out to us in our sinfulness. Kent Hughes in a sermon on this passage, makes an interesting point. He points out that here's John, the apostle, 
And he's talking about the glory of God in Christ and that inner Shekinah glory that is Jesus's by, by just who he is. And, and yet John does not at this point you know, bring up the Mount of Transfiguration. I mean, clearly this was a huge event in Peter, James, and John's life, and they write about it in other passages and places. But at this point, John does not use, hey guys, you should have seen what I saw. <laughs> I mean, here's Elijah, and here's Moses, and here's Jesus, and just like the glory of God in the tabernacle was between two cherubims, here's Jesus standing between these two great prophets, and the, the glory of God, that Shekinah glory that we all heard about in the, in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, all of a sudden, boosh, and man, we had to, I mean, he didn't point to that, did he? In this place, as he's highlighting the incarnation and the glory of God in Jesus, he doesn't bring up the transfiguration at all. Instead, John points us to God's grace expressed through Jesus as the ultimate picture of God's Shekinah glory. Isn't that interesting? He points us to the never-ending grace that is ours in Jesus, if we simply appropriate it. The image he gives here is of a fountain, a Jesus' fullness as the incarnated and eternal word has provided us with an eternal ever-flowing, never-ending fountain of grace from which we can drink and drink and drink and drink. This is what we have. So when we sin and we choose to worship ourselves instead of our Savior, there's this fountain of grace from which we can drink over and over and over again to beat back the accusations of Satan when he begins to yell, scream, or whisper in our ear at our moment of failure. When we despair and our hearts are hard and they are dry because of the events of life and the trials and tribulations, there's a fountain of grace from which we can drink that will soften our hearts give us power to endure and ultimately lift the despair. When life is going well and we are experiencing the happiness, the joy, the blessings that God pours out upon us, this fountain of grace is there to remind us that it is God who is the author of all of these good works and good things despite who we are. And so in the best of times, it's maybe even more important to drink deeply from the fountain of grace so that humility stays in place and a right perspective on life is maintained. Grace is not just for those who need Christ. Grace is for those who already follow Christ. And so when we face spiritual challenges, the fountain is there. When we face corporate challenges as a church, like concrete vendors, and we don't understand what's going on, the fountain is there. And the Lord says, come, drink deeply, and let my love for you fill you. Let my plans for you sustain you and encourage you even in times when you don't understand. So as we move to the table this morning, let's understand who we worship, who we celebrate. Let's recognize that just as Jesus embodied all of the grace of God, Jesus embodies the truth of God. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter two, for in him the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. When we follow Jesus, in part it's because we believe that he is the absolute truth of God. And when this happens, we begin to experience his work in our lives where we truly begin to understand reality. And that includes the reality of who we are apart from Christ. 
why he had to take on flesh. Why? That even though, as Anselm points out, that it's a human who should pay for the price of sin that humanity accumulates, only God can pay that ultimate price. And this table reminds us of this. This table reminds us that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And this meal that we now celebrate together in a moment is a a celebration that he is truth. He is reality. Our lives founded upon him are solid like the rock and the foundation that a structure is built upon because he's absolutely true. It's also a point meant to convict. If you've yet to trust in Jesus as truth, as Lord, as Savior, as God in the flesh who came and died the death that every one of us deserved to die, and then was risen again so that one day we too could have life. If you've yet to commit your life to Christ, this meal is intended to bring in a graphical manner your state of reality. Your state of reality right now is that if you die without Jesus for all of eternity, you are separated from God. And this meal is meant to tell you there is a way for salvation. And it comes through the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you aren't under some kind of a a prohibition from your own church, anybody who knows Jesus is welcome to take this meal with us. You don't have to be a member of Covenant Church to enjoy it. You just need to be a member of God's invisible, eternal church one day when we are in heaven, we celebrate that meal together with our Lord. If you don't know Christ, we ask you to pass this by. As I spoke a few moments ago, this meal is meant to convict you. It's meant to encourage you. Surrender to Christ. And in a few moments when we're all praying and we're preparing ourselves for this meal, that is the perfect opportunity for you to simply pray right where you are and ask the Lord Jesus to cleanse you from your sin, to acknowledge that he is Lord and you want him to be your savior. And today can be the day where that transformation from glory to glory to glory can begin in your life. If if your children have yet to profess faith, parents, or they haven't come to an elder to have that verified, we ask, use this moment as a teachable moment later in the day, pass the elements by, until that time which they are ready. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I have passed on to you what I received from the Lord, that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, later, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant. Every time you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. And every time we eat and drink of this body and this blood, we do celebrate and proclaim the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ as contained in the gospel. You have a a little, a little thing here. Let me give you some instructions before we spend a few moments in prayer. Turn it upside down so that the wafer is on top. You want to do that in that order. Peel it back, remove it, and then peel off the layer that has the drink. The Apostle Paul also says that this is a sacred moment. It's sacred because Jesus is here with us through the Holy Spirit. Through this meal, he feeds us, he strengthens us, he encourages our hearts and our souls. And because it's a sacred moment and a sacred meal, we should come to it in a sacred manner, which means to the best of our knowledge, we come cleansed from sin. Doesn't mean we are perfect people at all. 
doesn't mean we don't have our faults and our sins and our struggles and our addictions and everything else. What it means is that we are putting all of that before Jesus, asking for his cleansing power. So let's take a moment and I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and spend some time in quiet reflection and prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you perhaps if there's sin in your life that you've yet to confess. Spend a few moments in quiet prayer preparing yourself for this meal.